fortunate uh, to have uh, Professor Doyle uh, join us today to talk about, uh, um, I don't know what she's going to talk about because I don't know what's classified and not classified. <laughs> um, about, I guess about maybe 10 months ago, uh, you retired from the, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and uh, from a career as an intelligence officer on the operational side. Uh, and um, and we got to meet her, uh, came highly recommended, uh, and we sat in Bruce's office for a couple of hours and, uh, and uh, listening to, uh, uh, to uh, her tell us about her career, which is a fascinating career. But I'm going to be careful. I don't know what, she can, uh, what she'll talk about and not talk about, so I don't want to uh, get, on, uh, get crosswise with any classified information. Of course, she didn't tell us any classified information, but, uh, um, but she is now teaching for us. Uh, and she is, well, she's, has operational experience around the world and has done some, uh, some pretty amazing things, which uh, I think she'll share some of these, uh, uh, especially uh, I hope she'll talk about her citation there uh, and what uh, the work that she's done with the EQCon and uh, something near and dear to my heart. Uh, and um, and so, uh, so we're very fortunate to have her come and teach about Turkey and the Levant. Uh, some of you may be in her class. Uh, but we were very fortunate after she uh, she retired that she came to be able to teach for us. And of course, those of you that were here last January when we had uh, the St. Andrews Conference on what the new administration needs to know about terrorism and counterterrorism, I think that was your first outing after the uh, after they you came out from undercover and uh, yeah came into the public viewing here. So uh, and and of course we uh, she was also featured at our Polaris Intelligence Conference last month for those of you. Who, uh, who saw her. So she's got an extensive career in the intelligence community, and I think she is going to provide <coughs> advice, guidance, and wisdom uh, about uh, about the intelligence community and uh, the career, and hopefully uh, uh, provide you with some uh, some useful uh, things to think about. Uh, and for many of you, I know, uh, seek a career in the intelligence community. So we could have no one better to uh, uh, to be able to talk to us about that than someone who spent their entire career. <coughs> In the intelligence community. So, Paula, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you, David, and thank you all for coming today. How many of you are interested in the intelligence community or, or State Department? Because I've got both, both sides. All right, it's pretty good, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many of you are interested in the State Department? Let's start there. Okay, good. Uh, my career starts there, my journey starts there in terms of my federal government employment. Um, and then I, I transitioned over to CIA, and I can tell you a little bit about how that happened. Did any of you come to the, um, what are those talks called in, um, Friday nights? Oh, um, Spotlight. Spotlights. Yeah. Yeah. Spotlights. Spotlights. Did anyone come to the Spotlight? I don't want to repeat myself. There are three people here, four people. Okay. Well, they'll see. have to listen, because everybody else needs to hear this. So let me give you a little background about myself. Um, I was born in uh, South Dakota, uh, a very remote area in South Dakota. If anybody read Laura Ingalls Wilder's books, uh, I was fortunate enough in fourth grade uh, to, to attend Laura Ingalls Wilder Elementary School. What happened to me between uh, zero to fourth grade was I was living too far away uh, in a very remote area of South Dakota. My father raises cattle. Um, our hometown still had a K through 12 school. It was very small, um, very intimate. And while that might have been a great disadvantage in terms of being competitive to come into the great big foreign service and serve my country under uh, very sophisticated circumstances in the, in the very big world we live in, what I can tell you about those early foundational years is that um, I didn't realize at the time how important it was going to become to me to be from an area where you intensely belong. And one of my hopes for you is that if you've never had that opportunity to be part of a community where you intensely belong, just because of who you are, I wish that for you. Because it's something you can take with you no matter where you are, no matter who you're with, no matter what circumstances life puts in front of you. The whole notion of 
I belong here, I intensely belong here, and I know that I'm part of the community that cares about me, that's priceless. So, not from a fancy part of the country. Uh, my parents uh, probably will not appreciate this being on camera, but uh, they were quite young when they got pregnant. Uh, we could go there for a long conversation about <laughs> teen pregnancy uh, in a small community. Um, this was, this, you know, abortion was not an issue. It was not an option. I'm very grateful for that because I think if I had been a product of, of this uh, little romance a few years later, I, I don't know what would happen. My parents came from two different sides of the uh, uh, immigrant population. My mother's family uh, came to this country from Sweden, and my father's family came from Ireland. So we had the Irish Catholic thing going on, and we had the Swedish Lutheran thing going on and between all of this teenage pregnancy business. What I'm telling you is uh, it was a very a close-knit community, and it was a place where I felt like I intensely belonged. But there were also some really unflattering uh, things that I grew up with. Uh, I learned at a very young age uh, to distinguish yelling because I care and yelling because I'm mad. <laughs> uh, I developed that skill pretty young, and that is also something that served me very well, as, uh, particularly as I, as I entered my career at CIA. Um, another thing that I got from the community in which I was born was when you come from a really small town, does anybody come from a really small town? Like, really small? 33 post office boxes? Mm -hmm. Not that small. Not that small. <laughs> when you come from a really small town and you want to have a basketball team, everybody plays. It doesn't matter if you're good. Everybody plays. And that was another important um, aspect of my life because I was used to raising my hand. I was used to saying, oh, OK, I'll, I'll be that. I, I can try. I never went into an adventure thinking I was going to be the best at anything. And in fact, I'm not the best at anything. But I did go into almost every adventure in my life raising my hand because I felt it was an obligation. And so another, another theme that I would leave with you, if you do not have yet the opportunity to intensely belong somewhere, um, get into the habit of raising your hand. One of my favorite people at CIA, who, who just recently retired, used to stand before large groups of people and say, just say yes. Sometimes an organization knows better its needs than you do. And there are times when your own professional desires and aspirations will take first place. But more likely, the organization's needs are going to take first place, and you'll be really, really lucky if your aspirations match up with that, especially early on in your careers. So my point is if you just get into the habit of saying yes, you open yourself up to a whole broad range of opportunities that you otherwise might have just foregone. And how sad would that be? So that's a, that's a second point that I would leave with you. Um, the other thing that happens in a small rural environment in South Dakota in the 1950s and the 1960s is um, when our country goes to war, you go to war. Rightly or wrongly, whether you question the motives for going to war, that's a different story altogether. But the Dakota Territory was still the Dakota Territory in 1886. They only became states in 1886. So we're all immigrants with the exception of the Native Americans. Part of the way our people established themselves as citizens of this great country was by doing their part in going to war. So my father's father, uh, we called him Barney. Uh, Barney went to World War I. He was an unskilled, uneducated farmer, uh, raising cattle and farming. That's what he knew. Um, he ended up being a, a corpsman in France. And 
I grew up in a family. Right there, wrong me. Anybody from Germany? German background? So I grew up in a family where you know we went to war against Germany all the time. Uh, my mother's side of the family, my stepfather especially, who long story, we come from a small family, everybody's related. So my stepfather is also my second cousin, which means that his father is my great uncle. Um, everybody goes to war, and he in particular was a, a glider pilot. Uh, he was a glider navigator, sorry. And if you have ever seen the movie A Bridge Too Far, uh, he was one of the unfortunate casualties of Montgomery's ill-conceived campaign uh, in Holland. And he was captured, he unfortunately lived, but was captured by the Germans. And he spent several, almost a year, uh, in Stalag III. What do you know about Stalag III? Any scholars of World War II out there? Stalag III is in uh, modern-day Poland. Have you ever seen the movie The Great Escape? Or ever heard of it? My grandfather was gone from there by then, but uh, The Great Escape was the, the place from Stalag III. My point is these men came back after really rough slogs, and they came back to farm and my that grandfather came back to become the postmaster. He suffered from what we would call today PTSD. We didn't call it that back then. We just knew that Grandpa had nightmares and he had trouble sleeping and he would have to sleep in a chair at night because he would wrestle with himself. He died quite young. But the point of the story is service and sacrifice were just expected. Nothing was given to you. You were to earn your way in that immigrant population. So when the Vietnam War comes along, it's pretty unusual for my folk to contemplate going to Canada. Walter Cronkite played a really important role in my life. Um, in that part of rural South Dakota, we only got two television stations. Two. CBS was one of them and public television was the other, and that was the education channel. Uh, so Walter Cronkite was the big anchor man at CBS for 30 or 40 years. And he brought the Vietnam War into our living rooms. He brought the world into our living rooms. He brought the Watergate scandal into our living rooms. Uh, he brought the Watergate trials into our living rooms. And I don't know anyone that ever questioned his integrity or his bias. Well, the famous line was, you know, if I lost Walter Cronkite, I lost the country. Indeed. That was a, you know, he was was a real reliable weather vane. And I will tell you that when you grow up in a really right. small town, not even a town, <laughs> you were miles from the nearest town, um, television and the outdoors were kind of everything you had. And I wasn't really good at outdoors. Um, I was allergic to everything. I was allergic to animals. I was allergic to pollen and grass. And a farm is not a great place for me to live. Um, as my parents came to view that um, maybe this marriage wasn't made in heaven, um, and they found ways to part paths, I also learned uh, the importance of, of being independent being able to care for myself. Uh, women in that part of the country in the early 1970s were not expected to have their own checkbooks. Were not expected to have their own banking accounts. That was pretty heretical. I knew no one who was divorced. Nobody. Nobody. I knew widows and widowers, but divorce didn't happen in this part of the country until my parents divorced. <laughs> Uh, not an easy trailblazing moment, but what I learned in, in the process of helping my mother uh, leave that part of the country uh, was you really have to have a way to make your own money, or you really can't do anything. We had an ironing board for a kitchen table. Um, we, we used to go to a grocery store that gave us green stamps. 
and you would get green stamps and you'd lick them into these little books. And when you finally got enough green stamps, you could go to the green stamp store and you could get a card table. <laughs> that was a really big day for us. We got the card table and we got the four chairs. That was, that was huge. Um, so self-reliance was a really important part of my character development. Um, and that is something that I hope for you all. Uh, people talk a lot about stress and time management and overloaded um, competing uh, priorities for our time. Um, I, I wish for you that you develop ways to, to, to really build up your resilience because it is a tough world. And whether you go into the Foreign Service or you go into the intelligence community, it's not easy. It's a lot of fun. But it's also not easy. So having an intense sense that you belong, uh, having a sense of service and sacrifice is part of your DNA, and, and, and being resilient will take you very, very far in, in both communities, both the Foreign Service and the, uh, the intelligence community. I'm going to flash forward. My mother marries, uh, remarries. So it's a happy ending. Uh, for both my mother and my father. Uh, my mother remarries an Air Force guy. Now we travel all over the place, um, as Air Force people do. Uh, but we landed when I was in high school in England, and that was a really big eye-popping eye opportunity for me because I had an opportunity to see what an embassy looked like. Uh, this little girl had never seen an embassy. I'm not sure I had ever even seen an embassy on Walter Cronkite. Uh, but I was really oohed and awed by the presence of the American embassy, the American flag, the American presence, the American prestige abroad. Um, and when I was 17 years old, I pronounced to my mother and my stepfather that I was going to be a force service. That's me. That's what I'm going to do. And they were like, yeah, well, that's really good, Paul. Okay, good. I was always really smart. So they didn't question my <coughs> intellect. But they were a little more savvy about the world than I was. I thought you just applied and naturally you got in, right? Naturally, you just worked real hard. And I was really good at working hard. Um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, I only applied to one university. Fortunately, I got in. I did not have a lot of experience and a lot of um, people to talk to about how many schools should I apply to. Um, my mother and my stepfather were, were just getting going with their marriage, and I was this teenage kid. Um, my stepdad is younger than my mother, and my mother is only 15 years older than I am. So. We were an interesting crowd when we walked into any room. We kind of looked like we were all brothers and sisters. Uh, but what it also meant was they, they didn't have a treasury for me to go to college. And I didn't have a speaking relationship with my father at that time. And he didn't have much of a treasury either. So um, with some great help from some school advisors, I applied for a Pell Grant and I applied for work study. And um, I'm just a product of work study and Pell Grants. I'm very grateful for those programs. I, I would not have been able to even knock on the door of the State Department without those two programs. So I feel uh, a great uh, duty and obligation at this point in my career to be a teacher, to go back into the academic world and make sure that I do what I can to help you all get where you want to go because they sure did that for me. They didn't know that I didn't have a million dollars in the bank. They treated me like I did. So that's a really important aspect of my career, or my, my personal development. I did end up taking the Foreign Service test. Um, back then, the Foreign Service test was only given once a year, and it was given in December. My stepfather had uh, given me some good advice one Christmas. He was excited about my international affairs aspirations. Um, he's a pretty pragmatic kind of guy. And he said, what if you don't get in, Paul? What are you going to do? What are you going to do with that degree? Who's going to hire somebody with an international affairs degree? 
And you know, I hadn't contemplated it. It just never crossed my mind. I thought, wait a minute, I'm smart. I'm working hard. Huh. What do you mean? It took a while for that to wash over me that maybe this wasn't going to happen automatically the way I kind of already thought it would. And so I picked up a second degree in business, international business, because after all, I did have to agree with him. I wasn't the cat's pajamas. And I had no relatives in high places that were going to vouch for me. So um, it did take me an extra semester to get through school, which meant that I needed to take my final exams and the Foreign Service exam in December. I don't know how this all happens, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I was taking 18 and 21 credit hours a semester to get through the two degrees in four and a half years, and then you threw the Foreign Service test on top of all that. I don't know how this happens, but, but the miracle happens, and uh, I graduate with honors, and I pass the Foreign Service test. Um, you, when you pass the Foreign Service test, the written part of it, then uh, back in those old days, you would be invited to Washington for what was called the Orals. And the orals were um, kind of intimidating, but I didn't know what I didn't know. And the good news is sometimes that's a good thing. You just walk in with your first personality, you do the best you can, and you're not bothered by, you know, you're supposed to do this and this and this and this and make sure you smile and you wear the right clothes. I wasn't burdened with any of that because I didn't know. Um, it was a, you know, a nice panel, all men. Um, they asked good questions. There was a, the one thing I remember most about it was the inbox uh, exercise. I don't know if they still do the inbox exercise. It was, you know, you walk into a room, you're given an inbox, and they time you. They would give you an hour, and your job was to sort out. They give you a phone, they give you an inbox, and a list of things to do. And without much more context than that, um, you were to prioritize your day. And then you were to go into this panel room again and explain to them your rationale. There were no right and wrong answers, by the way. They really just wanted to see how you reacted to time pressure, whether you lost your cool, whether you were mean, nasty, uh, blaming others. Um, and they wanted to see, why did you make that decision? Like I said, there were no right answers. There were no life and death things in that inbox. There were no war plans in that inbox. Um, so I explained my rationale and left, and, and then nobody talked to me for a long time. I didn't know if I passed or didn't pass. I had um, gone back to Texas and uh, was, was, was working in Dallas as a financial analyst, and I thought, well, the worst thing that happens is that I get to remain as a financial analyst in Dallas. Not a bad day. Not a bad day. I did get a call in the office. I thought that was really funny. You know, when you already have a job and your next employer calls you at your office, it's just awkward, right? It's really awkward. Uh, we didn't have cell phones, so they really didn't have any other phone to call me on. I had a, a home phone, but we didn't even have answering machines back then. Nobody had an answering machine until when, like the 90s or maybe the 80s. I'm sure I didn't have one in my little apartment in Dallas. Um, but that was uh, in early December, and they told me to come on board on the 7th of January. So uh, I tidied things up with my employer and um, got a U-Haul. And then I found out the department paid for us to move, so I undid the U-Haul and <laughs> called, called the company. I didn't know people could do that. Um, and a company came along. I had a box spring and a mattress and a small television, a uh, kitchen cart. I had uh, gone to a, I can't remember if it was Montgomery Ward, it was Sears or something like that, and they had these big boxes. And I said, can I borrow these boxes? Can I just have them? Sure. So I took those boxes and I wrapped them in corduroy with, um, with brass tacks. Those were my end tables. Um, bottom line, I, I came to Washington basically with clothes. Um, 
I brought, I drove from Dallas in a snowstorm, rare unusual snowstorm in January. Um, because of the snowstorm, I couldn't come up through Tennessee. I had to go through um, I 10 area into Atlanta and come a long way up. Somewhere between Birmingham and Atlanta, it occurred to me I had nowhere to stay in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a good quality in my life. I, I am a self um, reliant person. I'm a very um, confident person. I do the dopiest things sometimes. I just, you know, I assume I'm going to get into the form service, so I study really hard. I take this job and I, I, I close my lease down in Dallas and I start driving with a Texaco, a Texaco credit card is all I have. And I have nowhere to stay. <laughs> so I get my offer of employment <coughs> letter out. <laughs> There's got to be a phone number here. <laughs> There was. There was a phone number uh, for a question, so I went to a pay phone and kind of embarrassingly said, I, my name's Paula Doyle. I'm supposed to arrive and go to work on, on Monday. I'm coming from Dallas. I don't have anywhere to stay. Do you have any ideas? When you come to Washington now, you're given a period of time to stay in a hotel. But okay. back then it was, you got, you know, welcome. Welcome to Washington. This miracle of you finding a house will happen on your own dime. Um, we're, we're better now than we were back then. Um, the miracle happens. This lady who answers the phone takes pity on me and she says, Oh, darling, you come stay with me. <laughs> so for the first three nights, I stayed with this lovely lady. Um, I would encourage you to plan better. If you are here in Washington, you have certain advantages. Um, I eventually ended up with a great roommate, and I, I enjoyed very, very, very much my time in the Foreign Service. I ended up doing three tours, uh, two in Latin America and one in Europe. Um, on my second tour, um, you know, on your first tour, you spent a lot of time uh, doing visas and doing basically all the jobs nobody else wants to do. Um, what I liked about that was that I had an opportunity to learn Spanish. I had an opportunity to play with the language a lot. Um, there was a there was a gentleman in in the embassy and uh, who had, who was just sick, 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 sick of doing visas. And the term "give me a break" was becoming very popular during that time. You couldn't really translate that into Spanish. Are there any Spanish speakers here? How, how would you translate "give me a break"? We are the, there's nothing, right? It's just, it doesn't, doesn't happen. Well, Gary decided it was dame un roto. <laughs> of course, oh, they're like, what are you saying? And he was just sick of hearing all the stories. It was like, you know, people come to the visa line with lots of really good, genuine stories, but a lot of people just come alive. So it's, it's a place where you learn in the Foreign Service that part of your life is going to be learning how to say no. Learning how to say no graciously, learning how to say no in an absolute fashion. Um, so we got a lot of practice with that, and Gary's dominating Roto will always live with me as the moment of just crushing, not liking his job, uh, on the line. In my second tour, um, I was the ambassador's aide. I do encourage you to try, if you have the opportunity, to be the ambassador's aide in the State Department. That's generally a, a job that doesn't go to a real junior officer, but in my case it was it was just one of those cross sections of I was available, and um, and it and it worked. Um, my Spanish was was also really good, so that that helped uh, kind of win the day. Generally, um, they're third or fourth tour officers, and it's a career developing job. You don't you're not going to be a, an ambassador's aide as a career. You're going to do it as a tour, and um, sometimes that leads to. Um, wanting to do that kind of work in the protocol office or or um, sometimes on the S staff, the secretary staff. Um, in my case, it was just a really great opportunity to learn about everything we were doing in, in, in this country. But also, um, being part of meetings, 
these were me. I was a junior officer. I had I had really no business being in, in meetings with ministers and presidents and and our visiting VIPs. Uh, George Schultz was the Secretary of State at the time. And he made visits all over the region. Um, those opportunities were priceless, and I knew that. I knew that this was something very special. And to take a moment to just breathe and be in the moment. Um, I also, in that country, because I was the ambassador's aide, um, we had a couple of officers who got pretty gravely ill, and they had to go home for long periods of time. And the ambassador and the deputy chief of mission were comfortable with my comportment and with my Spanish language and with my surface knowledge of a lot of different topics to allow me to take those portfolios for the periods of time they were sick. One of the officers was the science counselor, who is a brilliant guy. He was a real um, talented physicist. Um, and he was working uh, at that particular time with um, non-proliferation treaty issues. And so, you know, talk about an eye-popping moment. I'm not a physicist, and I'm not a chemist, and I'm not a nuclear engineer, but I found myself pouring over a lot of um, transactions between the governments on the status of, a, of, of what was of great concern to us at that point. There was a clandestine nuclear program in this country. And so from a nuclear non-proliferation treaty perspective, um, I just started learning about it. There was, that was my job. Uh, there was no training. Um, there was no booklet. Um, this was well before the internet. There wasn't an email coming with an attachment to tell me how to say these things in Spanish or how to learn the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, so I just did the best I could. I used Bob's files. I used, he had immaculate files, and he was, uh, he was a very scholarly kind of person. He never threw anything away. <laughs> so that was good for me because I could hear Bob's voice coming through all of his paperwork, and he ended up being gone for about four or five months. So I carried that portfolio, and with no idea in mind, gets back to raise your hand, just say yes. I had no idea that things like this were gonna come later. And if I hadn't had the exposure to the non-proliferation treaty exercises there, um, maybe the rest of my career would have gone very differently. Or maybe it wouldn't have happened at all. I don't know. Uh, after that tour, I, I came to Europe. Uh, big grown up Europe. When you're in Latin America, you always feel like, you know, the rest of the world gets all of the resources and, and all of the attention. And that was certainly true for, for Europe Bureau. Um, I enjoyed very much uh, my time in Spain. Um, the things that began to happen differently there were um, the NATO treaty was under siege. Our status of forces uh, agreement was under siege. Um, and then, and then all of a sudden, Saddam invades Kuwait, and things kind of change. Um, the coalition is formed, and a lot of my work focused on um, understanding the best ways the the, the U.S. Spanish alliance could support the war effort in Kuwait and uh, Iraq. Um, there were also great concerns about um, missile systems that were had been sold to Iraq, and some of the missile systems that had been sold to Egypt. And some of those missile systems had come from Latin America. And I didn't read about them as part of my non-proliferation period, but I sure knew the players. I knew the governments. I knew, I knew kind of how governments lie to each other and hide programs by then. I was pretty, I, was, I had lost my naivety about people always tell the truth because they're supposed to. Uh, not true. <laughs> uh, I had an opportunity to learn about a whole big missile system and, and um, work on a kind of a 
cutting edge at the time uh, uh, effort between the United States and a couple of Latin American countries to with with Spain to divert that technology away from the Middle East to take it off the streets. Um, also during that tour, um, the NAA comes to town. Who knows what the NAA is? Everybody knows what NATO is, but what's the NAA? The European Assembly. Huh? The NAA is the North Atlantic Alliance. It is the parliamentary arm of NATO. And they have big meetings. Generally, they move around. The different uh, NATO countries host those meetings. Um, that year, Spain was hosting the NAA. And Dante Fassell was our chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And he and his whole delegation came out. And because I had done so much protocol work, <laughs> before. I would get tapped a lot. Sometimes I would raise my hand and sometimes my hand would be raised for me uh, to take care of CODELs, congressional delegations. And then, yeah, this was a big one. This was our House Foreign Affairs Committee. My God, they write checks for the State Department, right? And it's Dante Fassell who was widely admired. Uh, we live in an age right now where politicians are usually defamed and it's shocking to me how the American public treat our public servants and our publicly elected officials. Um, Dante Fassell lived in a very different time. He came from Florida. He was widely revered. Um, they came out of a big session of the NAA, and I, there was just a different feel uh, in the room. Um, I was asked to get the King of Spain. <laughs> I've been asked a lot of things in my career, but um, but I've never been asked to contact a king before, and I wasn't quite sure how to do it. I just knew that I needed to do it somehow, and so naturally started working with the right people at the embassy who could get the king of Spain on the phone. And what happened shortly thereafter was just um, a stroke of a wonderful genius between the United States, the government of Spain. Um, on what would become the first Middle East Peace Conference. Um, it was the firm belief of, of the United States that Arafat would come to a meeting and that, the, and that Israel would come to a meeting if it were held in a neutral territory. It could be the United States, um, could be most of Europe. But tell me what you know about Spain. What made Spain such an attractive venue? Andalusia. Andalusia. What about Andalusia? You see, controlled by the Moors. Yeah, we have Granada down there. What else do you know about Spain? What else did it have? Um, you had the <coughs> expulsion of the Jews as well. Yeah, um, we have a very large Jewish population in Toledo, mm -hmm. and they coexisted with the with More the Muslims than the for how many years? Um, Long time, right? Spain was one of the first countries to recognize the Palestinian Authority. And that has to do with those, those more backgrounds. Um, Spain always had a strong uh, relationship with Israel. So I don't know what happened in that room, because I was just the control officer, you know, making sure everybody had pens. Um, but what I can tell you is that that phone call resulted in the king saying I'd be honored to, and then my whole life changed. Um, the Soviet Union was still a country at that point, and the Soviet Union and the United States co-sponsored this, this conference. Um, so for those of you who came to the other spotlight conversation, I'll just tell a couple of quick stories about what it was like to be in the palace. Um, so we know a little bit about Spanish history, right? What is Spain known for when they kick the Moors out? What, 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 what does 1492 tell you all, besides the so-called discovery of America? What else was going on in Latin America and other places? Um, you're exploiting the indigenous <coughs> populations in Latin America. They were 
called themselves something interesting. What do they call themselves? Conquistadores. Conquistadores. They're just bald-faced conquerors, right? So when you walk into the palace, what might what symbolism might, might be everywhere? Ooh. Horrifying symbolism. Um, um, the protocol director from the White House came out. Her name was uh, Miss Grooms. And um, I had never been in that part of the palace. Most of us as tourists had just been in the nice part of the palace where they let the public in. But this was going to be the big halls, separate rooms, or sidebars between the different delegations. And so the Spanish director of protocol for the palace met us. And I kid you not, we walked into these massive stone walls. And about three or four steps in, there's a tapestry on the wall over here. And it's the size of the wall. Hmm. <laughs> it's, a, it's a conquistador in full armor with his boot on the head of what was clearly a moor. And we're like, ooh. And the protocol director from the White House was just great. I just loved her. She's like, who you want to be? And she goes, that's got to go. <laughs> and she walks forward and she goes, and that's got to go. The statuary, the tapestries, these, these things had been hanging on the walls, right? since the 1500s, the halcyon days of the, of the Spanish Empire. Oh my god. So, you know, there were typical things like that. You know, that's got to go, that's got to go. And the good thing is that Cristina, the director of protocol in, in Spain, she looked at it too and she went, you're right. Oh, you're right. And so we didn't have a fight over those kinds of things. The things that, that Arafat and others thought about was whether Coca-Cola could be on the tables. Uh, this is how hard it is to do a true international meeting. Uh, if Coca-Cola was bottled in Israel, comma, Palestinians wouldn't drink it. We finally settled on Fanta and everybody drank Fanta orange. Um, <laughs> that took time. <laughs> um, it was a remarkable event. Uh, the Spanish have a lot to be proud of in, in taking on the onus of hosting this. ETA was very, very active during this period of time. They had a lot of their own terrorism problems. And there were a lot of concerns about terrorism in general uh, in Europe after Saddam had invaded Kuwait and there we just saw lots of movement of different kinds of people across Europe with um, grievances showing up and building small communities and then watching the grievances build. So really give King Carlos a, a, a great nod. Um, before that event the United States and the Soviet Union had what would be the last bilateral between our two countries. Again, raise your hand. I mean, I, I did not raise my hand for this one. Um, the deputy chief of mission said, you, you're good at this stuff. I want you to be co-control co officer at the Soviet embassy for the press conference that's going to take place there. <laughs> I was like, OK, OK. So uh, one of the fun things about that was um, the Soviets had just built a huge, opulent, opulent embassy in Madrid, uh, much nicer than ours. And so in the early days of the discussions, it was very clear that the press conference was going to be at their beautiful building, not our ugly old building. Um, in the run-up to the arrival of George H.W. Bush and Gorbachev, the um, minions like myself and another officer who spoke Russian, um, we would be going over to this embassy all the time. We were laying a cable for the TVs. This was a new building. It was opulent from the outside. 
but have you ever heard the slogan, it is so much better to be good, or so much better to look good than to be good? This was their embassy, yeah. The light switches didn't work, the sockets were mostly decorations, and so, <laughs> so we're like, we're going to have a press conference here. Oh my God, what are we going to do? So we had to work with the television stations, and they had to provide generators outside. And the likes of me are like on our hands and knees, like taping down. This is what protocol officers do. This is what control officers do. You do what you need to do to get the job done. Uh, one of the other fun facts about uh, preparing for a press conference with the president, and I doubt it's different from any of the presidents since, George Herbert Walker Bush was so scripted that he wanted to have a three by five card put on the floor exactly where each shoe needed to go. Now he's a very tall man and I'm a very short woman. <laughs> so we had to get from protocol, and they knew this, um, this ride. So again, down on floor, <laughs> like this, and making sure that the three or five cars. That's how you orchestrate a really successful press conference, though. Really, you don't, these are not just, you know, hey, guys and gals, get together and show up at the podium. You measure things. Gorbachev's very short. He's not very much taller than I am. And I have heels on today. Um, when Bush arrived, at the embassy, everything was finally done. It was such a joy. We were just standing in this truly opulent building facade, I would call it. Um, <laughs> when his limo arrived, and I realized for the first time, most of us realized for the first time just how tall he is. He, he literally had to unfold himself to get out the limo and then unfold himself up. He's just, he's really, really tall. Gorbachev's really short. <laughs> so the podiums needed to be, you know, adjusted appropriately so that Gorbachev didn't look my height. But the, the fun memory that I have is of Gorbachev coming down the stairs and, and with a big genuine grin on his face, greeted George H.W. Bush and and George H. W. Bush is he might have been born in, in in Maine, but he's a real Texan when it comes to his engagement style. Uh, very warm, effusive. He's a hugger. So Gorbachev comes up to about right here. <laughs> and so naturally nobody's taking pictures of this, right? Because that's not what you do. But that memory is seared into my brain. I have uh, great photographs of the, uh, of the event taken with a not very great camera. But um, none of us knew at the time that that was going to be the last, the last gasp. It was a very fine event. Um, little things happened. Marlon Fitzwater is the chief of staff, or chief of the press. I think it was his press post. Yeah. And they had a big lunch upstairs, but they had hadn't factored in all the people that were going to be around the table, so he ended up sitting at the kitty table with, with me. Um, and he took it very well. Um, he didn't need to. Again, none of us knew this was going to be the last meeting. You always think there's going to be another meeting. Um, during that time frame, um, the, uh, the chief of station in Madrid, what unbeknownst to me, was hopping mad that I've got this job, that I'm the one going in and out of the Soviet embassy. He's not a very happy guy. Only I didn't realize this. He felt one of his officers should be coming and going, because after all, it's a Soviet embassy. Right? <laughs> so I get called in at some point, and he's not a nice man. Um, and when I finally figured out, I, I'm used, I think I told you, I, I've got a really fine radar for are you mad or do you care? And, and I, I knew he was mad, but I, I felt that his ire was more sourced in caring about how this event was going to play out. So I'm pretty good at dealing with people who care. I love passion. I just, ah, there's nothing like it. Don't like anger. 
I'm, I'm good at dealing with that, but that's a different Paula that comes to the table. Um, as I came to realize that he was wishing someone else with better skills uh, was coming and going from the embassy, I said, well, what do you want from me? It is what it is. You can go to, to Mr. Casey and you can find out who else is going to be, you know, who you want to switch in and I'll switch out. I'm a busy girl. I'm busy taking care of the palace. I don't need this job. And I think he liked my spunkiness. Um, I think I kind of surprised him. I think I surprised him a number of times. Um, um, there weren't very many women working for CIA at the time. Uh, maybe that's what surprised him. Um, he asked me if I could remember what I was seeing when I was coming and going from, from the embassy. And I said, of course I can. And he kind of throws a piece of paper at me and says, go ahead, draw it out. Okay. Out, and I'm talking about, well, you know, this door is always closed and this one's always open, but there's nobody ever in it, and you do know that none of the outlets work, and it's really crazy. And he's like, the outlets don't work. I don't know why he cares about this, but he does. And over the course of a few meetings, he warms up to me, and after all of this stuff is over with, he he invites me to consider a uh, career change. Now. As my husband can attest, I'm going to talk about family issues here now. I'm going to switch gears. Um, I have been married to this wonderful man over here for 31 years. And um, we have a tremendous empathy for each other. We have a tremendous commitment to each other. Uh, I am the second wife. He came to the party with three children who I, who I love and adore. I thought at the beginning of our marriage I was unable to have children and then two more. Um, we make our decisions together. Um, when this issue came up, Michael and I took a lot of long walks in, outside our suburban community. And uh, I was prepared to leave and give this a shot. Uh, big decision. Uh, glad that it happened. Um, when I when I came on board with with the agency, at the onboarding was very different. Um, very much like the A100 class. It's very structured. You're kind of together as a group for a while, and then it's just like this, this big dispersed activity. Um, you go on an intro assignment, you take training at the farm, you um, come back to interim assignments, um, and then poof, you graduate. And then where do you go? Um, in my case, we came back to Washington. Um, I didn't realize one of the skills they were looking for was my knowledge of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. In the, in the 1990s, the U.S. government was making a pivot uh, from non-proliferation to counter-proliferation. That sounds sort of academic-ish. But it's not. In, it, it plays out very, very specifically, very differently in, in, in the world. Non-proliferation kind of goes like this. We have a non-proliferation treaty. A bunch of people have signed it. If we find um, a violation of the treaty, we are to engage the international community and do something about it. We are to inform and, and do something about it. We are to complain. We are to demarche. By the mid-90s, let's see, what do we have to show for ourselves between the signing of the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1974 to 1994? Do we have more nuclear weapons in the world or do we have less? Do we have more missile systems in the world, or do we have less? Non-proliferation is not working. But we've built huge structures 
for non-proliferation purposes. We have the IAEA, we have a whole bunch of other UN meetings that we conduct as part of our diplomacy efforts and part of our compliance commitments under the non-proliferation treaty. But under the Clinton administration, there was an acknowledgement that this non-proliferation thing is not really working so great. Um, what does counter-proliferation look like? We were getting into counter-terrorism, and we were getting, we had always been into counter-intelligence, counter-narcotics, but we hadn't yet really put our talons into the notion of countering proliferation. What did it mean to interdict something at sea? I don't know, that wasn't part of the NPT. So the government, our government, working with a few other governments, started working together on what does counter-proliferation look like? What are the boundaries of it? How do you, can you, can, can you, can you just interdict? Or can you do other things? Can you diddle? Can you diddle with somebody else's nuclear program? I mean, if they're going to have one, do you want it to succeed? These were the big questions of the 1990s and the early 2000s. And so I walked into a milieu that I didn't realize I was a unique, I was a unique person for. There were a lot of analysts at CIA who had been in, in the world of non-proliferation, but not very many case officers. And I, I had, I had uh, selected to be a case officer. So I found myself in an office in, in, in Europe part of CIA and that was really really fun because the IAEA is located where? Vienna. Oh, Vienna. Vienna. And the UN does a lot of work in Geneva. Um, where do most proliferating countries go to buy their stuff? We had all these sanctions in place in the United States. We were a hard market. People were figuring out how to buy things from our companies but where did most of the, where did the Pakistanis go? Where did the Iranians go? Where did they all go shop? They shopped in Europe. So I found myself in the middle of a really great stew, right? I understood the non-proliferation treaty. Not many of my colleagues did. I knew that certain meetings took place at certain times. And I'm like, well, why aren't you at these meetings? What meetings? They had been non-proliferating those meetings, sending non-proliferation experts there, and it took a while for us to get our arms wrapped around the counter-proliferation. Um, worked on those issues for a couple of years, and then we went overseas, and then um, came back home again, and then we went back overseas again. 9-11 happens around this period of time. Um, came back home uh, for a longer period of time. And uh, when we were, in, when I was in my fifth tour, this one, um, finished sixth grade. And when we came home, uh, we were home, whatever home was, Vienna, Virginia. And uh, we had learned through the first three kids that it's really perilous to move kids in high school really perilous. Sort of in the category of just don't do it. Not after 10th grade. Um, so there was Will about to go into 7th grade and we decided to implement a new family tradition and that was um, if you're in 7th grade or above you get a vote. You get a vote around the table. Dad gets a vote, I get a vote, the three older kids could have cared less because they were not involved anymore. Uh, in the moves, although they liked to come see us when we were busted overseas. Um, and for several years, Will's vote was, no, I want to stay. I want to stay. I want to wrestle. I, wanna, I want to be on basketball teams. I want to, you know, ride a little yellow school bus. Um, I want to learn how to drive. I don't want to be robbed of all those rites of passage. So we stayed put for six years, which is nearly unheard of. Um, 
Then we went overseas again, and I broke and violated all those rules. Both Michael and I did. We thought about it long and hard because this one, this one, I uh, was in ninth grade, and I was offered an opportunity to go to a large station and lead it, and I really wanted to do it. And we said, hmm, hmm, we're okay if we can do 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Ninth is kind of junior high anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> Rationalizing. That's middle school anyway. <laughs> so we broke the news to Rob. He's not very happy. Um, he, of all of the kids, was the smartest and the most athletic and the most mercurial. And he really had a tough time with with the notion of moving. Um, and uh, I can now, with hindsight, look back and go, okay, that was the right thing to do. He did thrive there after the first, the first six months were miserable, though. Um, he eventually found the right group of kids to, to be friends with, and he settled into a good scholastic tradition there. And he's now very proud of the fact that he got to graduate overseas. And he lords that over the other brothers and sisters all the time. <laughs> um, then I came home uh, uh, after that tour. James Clapper had been named the DNI when I was on my last tour. And he visited he visited three times. Um, not common for a DNI to go that many times to one station, but he loved my country. And so he came um, once as USDI on his farewell tour when he was retiring, and then quickly turned around and came back as the new DNI after the whole Denny Blair fight with Panetta. That was charming. Um, and I'm glad we won that fight for lots of reasons. We can go into that if you have questions about it. Um, I had gotten to know uh, Director Clapper pretty well, and most importantly, he had gotten to know me pretty well. And he asked me to be his uh, Deputy National Counterintelligence Executive. Uh, we had just come out of WikiLeaks, which was really still very, very challenging for our relations with all kinds of foreign governments. And we were not yet uh, aware of what Snowden was going to do and, and then defect to Russia. So it was a really interesting time <laughs> to be the Deputy National Counterintelligence Executive. Um, I had uh, a lot of opportunities a few years earlier to engage with the White House on Iran issues, um, but uh, nothing like the weekly, bi-weekly meetings after Snowden defected. Um, that was an interesting opportunity to watch the policymakers at play. Uh, from a work-life balance perspective, Michael decided it was a great time to make his second cross-country bicycle trip. Um, really, really smart because I was never home. Um, he's made two cross-country bicycle trips, one from San Diego to St. Augustine and the other from Yorktown, Virginia to Pueblo, Colorado, up and up and up and up the Continental Divide to Missoula, Montana, and then off to Florence. Oregon, and it was that trip that he was on when Snowden decided to defect to, uh, he showed up in Hong Kong and he decided to defect to Russia. So I'm very grateful from a work-life balance perspective that he was off on a bike ride because I didn't go home very often for several months. After that, then I went back to the agency and my last tour I was one of the Associate Deputy Directors of Operations. Uh, not a great job for work-life balance. Uh, <laughs> Michael made another bike ride while I was in that job. Uh, that's part of the, the partnership uh, I would encourage you to make with your spouses. You, everybody has something they love to do, I hope. And when you're going to be on separated deployments or you're going to be working crazy hours, especially when the kids are sort of empty nesting out of your lives, um, you got to really have something that you love to do, something that that you can enjoy both together and apart, and then continue to grow your relationship when you when you get back together. Those bicycle rides, I only got emails. I didn't get to bike those miles, but I lived vicariously through through his discovery of America. We are we are kind of we're the kind of people who grew up in America, but we didn't get to see much of it. 
we, 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 we kept going overseas, and so this is a time in our lives when we're really excited to learn more about our own country, our own people. The longest uh, running operation I was involved in um, on this, these are just little things, really. Um, I just brought a few things for you to look at, not to ooh ah, but to just know that the, the intelligence community does um, prize um, accomplishment, it prizes impact, not just longevity. Um, and a lot of new officers misunderstand that. Uh, longevity is what earns you your pension. What you do is what earns you whatever pieces of stuff they want to give you. Um, and I'm very grateful for all of the stuff I earned. Um, I have a we have a room in the house, so the whole wall is just is just laying on the floor because I'm not an I love me person. I don't know what to do with the stuff to honor it. it, it it's in its boxes. I brought a couple of things here for you to look at. Um, but the thing that I'm most, most, most proud of is, is the ability to be part of a very small, unique team at CIA. And it had everything to do with those first days in, in counter proliferation. We were figuring out what it meant to counter a proliferation program. And all sites were put on the biggest proliferator in the history of nuclear weapons. And that was AQCon. Um, he studied as a young man in Holland. He had a, a, an internship, or, or maybe it was like a work study program, at a company called Urenco. Urenco, uh, a Dutch company, uh, up and up, a uh, big signator of the non-proliferation uh, world. Uh, they uh, enriched uranium. And, and A.Q. Khan was a smart man. He, uh, he, he, he was a skilled engineer. He had access to plans that today no one would, would give access to. But back then, people were pretty naive. And the Dutch will tell you that they were that they just had never contemplated that someone like this would come in and steal the blueprints for their um, uranium enrichment process. There's a lot of things I can't talk about um, in the context of enrichment, not, not because you can't go find it at libraries, but I, I always kind of put a, put a, put a hermetical seal around the tennis the, the, the types of things we did as a small team because we became so intimately part of each other's lives. Uh, to this day, we go have dinner with, with each other. Um, we go to each other's funerals. We go to baptisms. We go to children's weddings. Uh, this was a team like none other that I ever had the opportunity to be part of. So if you'll recall that intense sense of belonging, piece of me, this is what, this is the most important aspect of the AQCon work uh, the agency did, uh, is to me. Each person played their part, each person stayed with it for a very long time, that's very unusual, in either State Department or um, CIA. We, we don't, uh, we tend to prize, move every two or three years. Uh, keep acquiring more information. And, and I kept flitting around the world, but the core elements of this particular team stayed in Washington, they stayed together, and I played cameo roles for 10 years in this operation until the very end. I was there at the very beginning and at the very end. Um, very fortunate to the, to, to the teamwork that we had developed that they were able to bring me in from various foreign countries to play these roles at specific times when um, certain kinds of people needed to show up for meetings and with proliferators. Um, the denouement, if you will, of, of this particular activity had two prongs. And um, if you're really interested in, in reading about it, George Tennant's chapter 15 is um, 
lays it out in, in, in fine detail. Um, he talks about a small team in that chapter. Um, he obviously doesn't name us. Um, I won't name any of the other people. Um, the impact was uh, twofold. One, uh, President Musharraf agreed to put Abdul Qadir Khan under house arrest um, and began looking more carefully at the Khan Research Lab's activities and whether they were proliferating under national programs or proliferating on their own. So that was a really nice gift. Um, the other aspect was Khan's provision of world, world, world class centrifuge technology to Libya, which is all in chapter 15. It's called The Merchant of Death. Um, and there's a reason that chapter is called The Merchant of Death. You'll have to read it to find it. There are lasting things about the counterproliferation world that um, if you ever join CIA and you want to be part of that, I can promise that you will be ever challenged. It's hard, but it's very satisfying. And when I think about the opportunity to serve and to go through uh, moments, if not months, or years of sacrifice, I wouldn't have it any other way. I can look back without any regret. Uh, maybe a little bit of wish that our team had had a little bit of opportunity to work against North Korea, just a little bit, because a little bit goes a long way. Um, but some things just don't happen for you. Uh, on the North Korea front, um, my own personal view is that the, when, when the notion of six-party talks was born, they became a permanent distraction. I am built to, uh, I have a bias for action, and I admit that. My bias is towards action. I have observed our country when we have watched and watched and looked and looked and been really smart and done nothing. And I have watched and we have watched and watched, we're really smart, and decided to do something. And for better or worse, I believe doing something is better than doing nothing against a nuclear program. And the record's really clear on that. Not so clear on the counterterrorism side, but I think that story is still unfolding. Um, but when you know what kind of technologies are going into a program, and you know who runs them, and you know how they work, and you don't want them to work, you can either watch it, or you can do something about it. And to me, that's the difference between our country's approach to non-proliferation and counter-proliferation. But I'll tell you, countering is hard. It's hard to get policy approvals. It's hard to get the technologies. It's hard. It's just hard. But it's very, very satisfying. And our foreign partners count on us to be really good at this. Really good. Just about busted the uh, busted the clock. Do you have any questions for me? Sure not. Yes. First of all, thank you for that. Very interesting. Uh, um, for the sake of counter proliferation, uh, do you think that the uh, Iran nuclear deal should and can be scrapped? So, I I have a special place in my heart for the Iran the Iranian program and the Iranians. I was the chief of operations for Iran for a couple of years. Um, I happen to believe that Jack Poa is a, as good a deal as we could have gotten at the time. When Hatami in 2003 made the bold decision to, to put on hold the nuclear weapons program, um, that, sig that was the biggest um, signpost for me that activism and pressure were working. Uh, Iran saw U.S. troops to their east, to their west, and to their south. 
and the world community was unified around uh, preventing uh, a full-up nuclear weapons program. We, as you know from the declassified NIE, talked about that for hours, um, in 2007 the decision to declassify the key judgments uh, was made in a very short period of time and really left the community flat-footed. Um, but it's out there now. You can, you can read the key judgments. Um, <coughs> those key judgments were declassified during the Ahmadinejad period, and that was not a good period. <laughs> that was not a good period in U.S. relations. Uh, Rouhani is, uh, in my view, a lot more like Khatami. Uh, we have developed areas of common ground. Those negotiations were really, really hard. There were multiple countries, multiple motivations at the table, and any time you can meet out something like that, that has a way to verify, and this is where I would just caveat, it was, it, it's a good agreement if we can verify it. Iran's program is at such a mature stage that there's very little maneuverability left. We have no maneuverability with North Korea. None. Zip. Oof. It is. It's existential. In Iran, they haven't put all the peace parts together yet. So I think that's a noble cause. And, and I think the president understands that that's a noble cause. He doesn't necessarily like all the pieces of it. And, and what you're probably going to see is he wants stronger verification methods in place. We have to be able to look at Iran's nuclear military facilities as well as their civilian facilities. That's, that's, where, that's where I would hope that we could amend and not just trash. During your career, did you see any operational shifts in the intelligence community um, and like the way that they, like, I don't know if 9-11 might have been a, a period of that, and if so, what, did you see those shifts as positive or negative? Well, after 9-11, it grew. It grew a lot, and uh, you know, the, the, the most important thing I ever did in my career was that, and it was a small team of us. I've never subscribed to Bigger is Better come from a small town, <laughs> like intimate compartmented conversations that do things instead of just talk, talk, talk. And I find that when you get big, big, big groups of people together, there's just a lot of motion that sometimes gets um, misrepresented as forward progress. Um, so the big shift was, yes, we got a lot more resources. Uh, we began changing our trade craft uh, to a war zone trade craft. We had to do that. We, we absolutely had to do that in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, but I, but I think that we're due for some additional shifts on trade craft. The cyber piece is, was was also really big and transformative, both in terms of a collection means and uh, offensively and defensively, but also just in terms of itself as a target, as as foreign governments set up their own cyber commands and cyber offensive espionage programs to come after us. Those are the two really big shifts I've seen. Yeah? Do you think, um, sure, the two-part question first, do you think that the sort of prominence of the CIA and the American intelligence apparatus is going to remain as high as it's been with the trend that we've seen in cyber? And the second part of that would be, do you think that recent emphasis on cyber is overblown or about right or underestimated? I think it's misunderstood. <laughs> uh, so cyber command is a military command. It's a military command. It's not an intelligence service. Um, so CIA, um, I believe, is because of its mission, it does counterintelligence, it does foreign intelligence, it does covert action, and we all have to know that force protection is that big umbrella that comes over all of those operations. No other element in the U.S. government does all of that. 
And the president meant for it to be that way, and no president has amended that since 1947. Um, so if you want to do things, not just know things, the CIA is going to continue to be the place where most of those um, actions are directed by the White House. Um, when it comes to military operations, that's purely DOD. Um, uh, the, the, the stand up of Cyber Command as its own unified command, I think, is a really important development. Um, it recognizes that we, as the American people, know that cyber offensive and defensive capabilities are needed for warfare. And it puts all of our enemies on notice that this is a warfare element. Um, so, on the cyber piece, I just think a lot of people use the word and they don't really know what it means. And that's dangerous for us. Um, I think we have a lot more work to do in the policy area to define cyber offensively, defensively, commercially, and what should be protected. When we were talking about nuclear weapons programs, growing out of the Manhattan program in the United States, we knew what technologies needed to be protected and never sold to anybody. We haven't had that conversation on cyber. There are technologies on cryptology that ought not be sold. They just ought not be sold. But we haven't had that conversation. I don't know that Congress Congress and the White House have to figure out who's going to have the conversation and finish it instead of just talking and talking and talking. I think at one point, Congress had 43 bills on cyber floating around between the House and the Senate. Who's got all that time to write all that stuff? And then none of them passed. So we're sort of in this odd world of opinion. And I would love for our country to be more specific about what's important about cyber, what's permissible. Maybe not a popular approach, but anything else, or is it time to go? Well, time to go. we reached culmination. Let's see, it is 1.30. So, uh, Professor Doyle, I'd like to, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you for sharing very uh, personal uh, but insightful and incisive uh, insights uh, on your career and, uh, and really I think uh, you, you've you inspired uh, I think uh, both to serve the State Department, CIA, uh, but to serve and uh, and so your your words are uh, I think uh, very useful to all of us and we appreciate uh, you sharing them with us. So on behalf of uh, Center for Security Studies we'd like to give a well, thank it's you. Not as big as your, I didn't your bring other you ones, anything. But, uh, but it's, you know, of course, theory, policy, scholarship, and practice. You're an expert awesome. practitioner. You supported the policy world. And now, scholarship, you're back to teaching. Scholarship is so. my application. So, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.